I am Janet Van Zorn. I'm uh, the pest management specialist with the Lake Ontario Fruit Program. And I'm co-hosting this meeting with Mike Baisdow from Eastern New York region. Um, a quick reminder for any of you guys who haven't been on a Zoom meeting for a little while to um, please go ahead and keep your audio muted and your video off for the duration of the talk. That just helps with um, bandwidth and things like that. We're gonna save questions till the end of each portion of the talk. And, um, and at that point, if you want, you can unmute. For anybody who is looking for those DEC credits, you guys will need to do four things in order to get the credits. You'll need to click on the link that I just put into the chat right now. In order to get to the chat, um, you can go ahead and move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen. Um, so I just put that link into the chat. Make sure you fill that out. Make sure you also fill one out at the very end of the webinar today. So you will need to fill out two Qualtrics forms in order to get your credits. You will also need to be logged in for the entire time. And if you have not yet done so, you'll need to send me a picture of your ID. So with that, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker today is Dr. Carrick Cox. Um, he needs no introduction, but he's an associate professor. professor. Um, in the School of Integrated Plant Science at Cornell University, and his program specializes in applied plant pathology, mycology, and community and stakeholder education. We're excited to um, hear you talk about strep resistant fire blight today. So if you oh. wanna, oh, there you go. There we go, I'm gonna unmute. I just got my DEC credit thing in and just that wonderful introduction. That's how you pull it off. Now I'll forget at the end and then I won't get credits and that'll be that. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and it's my goal and this one to wait is it even working it doesn't look like it's sharing are we seeing sharing on your end it looks good yes. okay i just usually see that green bar don't see the green bar okay yep yeah. so we're going to start off we're going to start off with a part one and a lot of this work has been a compilation of like a lot of my students including my new student liga who's going to kick us off in a minute and then Isabella, who will be doing the anchor leg of the presentation tour, and students like Anna Wallace and Katrin Ayer have provided uh, a lot of input and content over the years. And then to get us going, yep, we're going to start off with thing. three different phases to this uh, mini talk here before we get into the end of part one. Antibiotic use in general and antibiotic use in agriculture and fire blight. And then I'll go into the old stuff with streptomycin resistance. And then finally, I'll talk about what to do when you have it. And then we'll switch gears. And then Isabella will come in and talk about recent years of the survey, how to get your stuff submitted and tested. And But there'll be a, a discussion point right in the middle. And then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Liga. And she's going to take point on this first few slide section. All right, so uh, when we're thinking about antimicrobial resistance in fruit systems, so all of these fruit crops, they're very long lived, more than five years, some of them 10, 15, and these are, they have to be managed for a very long period of time. Uh, a lot of these pathogens, such as like um, manilia that causes brown rot for stone fruit, they have a lot of uh, numerous secondary infection cycles. Uh, that means they be, are becoming infected, infected again, so that means there's a need for repetitive treatments. Um, it's kind of like if you think about the same as uh, in human and in veterinary medicine, um, that there's multiple doses of antibiotics needed to control a disease. Um, and a lot of these populations are localized and there's not a lot, not, not a lot of influx of new members into these microbial populations. So there's two main phases when we're thinking about antimicrobial uh, resistance and how it develops. So you look over here, uh, we have our path pathogen population and in light blue, we have our sensitive isolates and then in um, orange that are not yet there yet will be our resistant isolates. So um, what I want you to know is that fungicides are not inherently mutagenic, uh, but mu mutations are pre-existing. Um, and these advantageous mutations um, such as overcoming resistance, they do not happen a, lo a lot. They occur very infrequently. So what happens, we have our here is one, our resistant isolate that we're looking at. And what happens if we keep um, spraying or keep letting it go, we're going to have a lot more uh, resistant isolates that multiply. But the applications of fungicide doses do not necessarily cause emergence, but it will rather select for establishment. So it will not let, um, not cause new pathogen, um, new resistant pathogens to emerge, but it will select for establishment. 
So if you're looking at here, so th this, these are two of our orchards here at Agritech. <laughs> so for the past summer, <laughs> Um, and up here we have a, a, a very damaged orchard by fire blade and here's we have our large population size obviously you can see that there's a lot of Erwinia over here and then here's a different orchard uh, which is, does not look as sad and there's a lot smaller population size you can see here on both sides so what happens here if we have a lot of a um, lot of uh, population over there the more pathogen, the higher probability of advantageous mutations occurring. So the higher the probability of um, resistance to occur. So if you're going to keep spraying a population where um, there's a lot of um, uh, the population is extremely large, there's a higher chance you're going to be selecting for um, mutations to be occurring. But if it's as small as you can see here, so if these isolates um, um, then replicated, you can see that these are all of our uh, resistant isolates now. But if we're looking at our small population, you know, even if there's, you know, one isolate that is no longer sensitive, um, but becomes resistant, then maybe we can uh, wipe it off with um, double nickel or something else if we can no longer control it with streptomycin. So if the population is smaller, then obviously there's going to be a lower probability for these mutations to occur. Um, and maybe they don't even occur at all. Maybe these three orange ones never happen. So um, when we're thinking about antibiotics in three crops, so there's three main groups. So we have oxytetracycline, streptomycin, and casuomycin. So I just want you to um, know. So basically, let's see, for Arrhenia and Malara, uh, fire blight, we obviously care about. So these all three can be, uh, can be controlled by oxytetracycline, streptomycin, and casuomycin. Um, and the same, all these three groups, you can see we can be controlled to control bacterial diseases in citrus and in tomato and pepper or blister spot in apple. Um, you know, so the interest for antibiotics um, only happened for mostly um, in, the, in the in 1950s and it was the first one was for and in Mulavara. So for the fire blade causing uh, pathogen. So um, want to transition a little bit into management and how fire blight happens here in eastern New York. So um, as um, in the in the spring before um, when we are still dormant before bud break, we can apply copper, um, you know, so it starts with cankers oozing as like the weather is starting to get a little bit warmer. Um, and we can see that ooze getting out. So the primary infection is happening and um, the bacteria is getting into the flower. Uh, through the stigma and that's when you want to apply your antibiotics and or uh, biologicals that bloom so as the infection goes on further um, blossoms become blighted and it travels down to the shoots and then that's when our secondary infections are happening and we have um, insects and wind that can disperse this um, ooze every, everywhere on actively growing tissues um, so then during the season as ooze is being spread that's when you want to use your PGRs and use sanitation and pruning um, so starting from petal fall all the way up to harvest and you know last summer we pruned all summer long <laughs> to get rid of fire blades so that's what you're going to be doing all um, season long until um, harvest so then so how to control these so the three antibiotic groups that I mentioned before so the first two are streptomycin oxytetracycline um, so streptomycin, um, it's aminoglycoside antibiotic. Um, so what it does, it kills that uh, by inhibiting a translation for the bacteria, um, and it's uh, locally systemic and goes into the tissues. Um, so we went 50 plus years since the 1950s without um, developing resistance, but now um, obviously there is resistance possible as there are a variety of posmets and different chromosomal mutations that are being seen in these populations. And then um, there's also oxytetracycline. Um, so the, this uh, antibiotic, what it does, it interferes with a lot of these essential proteins that are responsible for growth of bacteria. Um, so it's not a, it doesn't, um, it doesn't kill um, the bacteria, but it is, works as a, a protectant and, a, and it's bacteriostatic. Um, right now, um, the reason, um, so there's very limited use and um, effectiveness, but because of that, there's also no resistance for Arrhenia for it right now. But it's because it's not being used as much. Uh, and then we have our third one, um, and Arcosumin. So this is a aminoglycoside antibiotic. 
Um, so initially, this was developed um, as a protectant as well um, for the rice um, for the rice blast. Um, and then in the 1950s, uh, it was validated for fire blight, but testing got stopped because of phytotoxicity. And then they relamped the formulation, and now it's being safe to use for apples. Um, so now we have a full approval from an EPA. Um, so for casugamycin, um, we can use it now in the United States and in New York for fire blight, um, as long as there's still blossoms on the trees. Um, and then, so this is um, this is also what I wanted to mention about this, that it isn't uh, not effective against bacterial species in porn and medicine. So there's, we don't have to worry about developing the runoff to developing uh, resistance for um, uh, in veterinary medicine or human medicine. So when it comes to managing fire blight with antibiotics, um, so some of you might be familiar with this. This is um, a screenshot of the NUA uh, disease forecasting uh, fire blight page. So growers will only use antibiotics. So in two different scenarios, one is a bloom. Um, so before uh, a bloom, when these alerts pop up, so these are also, um, Carrick and I also, we do send out alerts and management recommendations for each of the regions um, to when these high infection events are happening right before to know when you need to spray, uh, when you need to apply your applications. Um, so you can use the new uh, decision support system to tell you when you need to um, spray before an infection is happening to be able to manage it better. Um, second, uh, you also want to be able to apply antibiotics if there's a large trauma event, uh, like a storm and hail that might be damaging, um, getting into the um, making um, wounds into the blossoms in the trees, you might want to apply antibiotics there as well. So when we're thinking about for selection for antimicrobial resistance for non-targets. Um, um, our lab did uh, multiple studies and we did uh, find that these <clears throat> published papers that the um, selection for antimicrobial resistance for endophytes was not affected, um, but after multiple applications, there can be selection uh, in epiphytic populations. So with that, I will let Carrick take the lead. All right, great. Nice, thanks, Leah. All right, let's let's talk about how it all began if you will let's see if i can move this like bar thing out of the way there we go i'll mix it up bring up the chat window stick that over there good all right so let's look at what had happened in, in all in the early years and then where we are now and i'm going to talk a lot about some of the genetics of what we've got as well um so at first our first detection was around the turn of the uh, what is this thing, the millennium now yep i guess so um and we had two strains. I'm going to use the term SMREA, and that's just Streptomycin resistant Erwinia. And they were detected at two neighboring orchards and farms in western New York. And um, it was a, a, a traumatic event, and the growers eradicated both orchards. And for the most part, um, it was believed that that was the last of it, if you will. And then in uh, 2011, we uh, got a call looking for some really late stage um, fire blight in nursery blocks of, uh, for budwood material blocks, not actual nursery plantings, as you can see on the right. And um, we, we detected it. We first thought, ah, it's just fire blight. And then we went back and was like, ah, oh, what the heck, let's just run the battery of tests on it. And we did. And then it turned out that it, you know, it was at a couple of different places in the region. I mean, clearly the, the trees were not used for budwood that year. But um, and they were terribly wiped out. We looked at seven other places in the region that had fire blight. Even this is kind of in like late September. It's getting kind of cold. We were still able to get it out, uh, hence it was alive, and uh, find these sort of um, terrifying situations. And then at that point, we began to embark upon a long, more than 10-year effort in terms of looking at these types of things. From about the first phase, we'll call it as 2012 to 2020, we looked at high risk sites, mostly in Western New York. And then after the first couple of years, we started moving to any farm with a notable fire blight outbreak. And we looked at about 182 commercial sites and about 3000 isolates in general, looking at all of these different types of things. And as we move along and sort of talk about, that was sort of the, the first stage. And I'll show you some of those results later on. But some of the other things that we begin to learn is we wanna ask our question, what, what's the identity of these samples? Where do they come from? Are they different? Is it just one strain? Is it a bunch of strains? 
that we're selecting from spraying, and that brought us to the next part of the equation. So we can grow them on media and see, oh, do they grow in the presence of streptomycin, yes or no. But then we wanted to know, like, is it one strain? Is it multiple strains? And this brings us to this rather colorful circular diagram that's usually only reserved for molecular biologists to see. But what this is, is this is the Irwinia genome. And it's unlike our genome, which is like 23 chromosomes times two, um, it has a single circular one. And it's really small by comparison. It only looks like about 300 and uh, it's about 3 million base pairs. That's pretty small um, in all. And what they were learning is when they were sequencing these things early on, there's, there's about a 99% homology. So that made everyone really kind of frustrated in terms of determining traditional methods for strain differentiation weren't just going to work. It was gonna need something a little bit better. This little tiny baby circle right there, and we'll talk about what those are a little bit later, that's a plasmid. Bacteria also, in addition to their own big genome, have little tiny, little, um, little tiny similarly small chromosomes called plasmids and on them they contain things like antibiotic resistance and we'll go into the nuts and bolts of that as well so the question began um how on earth are we going to figure out how to differentiate these things and that leads us to another really strange uh section of the dna now there's this component of the dna in bacteria that's used for the bacterial immune system, so to speak. It's an adaptive immune system and have these repeat pieces and they got these little things called spacers. And what we could do is use these spacers as like a genetic fingerprint to determine who murdered your orchard, so to speak. And these spacers and repeats fall into three regions. You might hear weird things like CRISPR region, so this is what it is, these little fingerprint sections of the genome, which we can look at these different spacers, fall into three regions. And they're also part of the CRISPR-Cas9 things. If you ever heard of CRISPR-Cas9 editing, uh, other people use these genes and tools to edit and do genome splicing. We're just looking at it to look at a fingerprint to find out who murdered your orchard. And in Irwinia, they have three regions that have these different things in it, giving us three different places to fingerprint an individual isolate, CRISPR region one, CRISPR region two, and CRISPR region three. The interesting thing is about these silly things that often is not known is they will lose or gain spacers with evolution. So as the silly bacteria evolve, they may gain or lose spacers. Hence, the ones that are more basal will have fewer or different ones and the ones beyond will continue to add on new ones as they become newer and newer and sort of uh, happening over time. And it looks like it's about 100 years per spacer, so to speak, which doesn't tell us too much about fire blight here because we're only about 300 years old of growing apples. But, um, but anyway, it sort of gives you an idea of where they came from ancestrally speaking. And we're gonna use these in order to map the things. And so once you start getting these, you'll find as you start sequencing a bunch of these isolates, you get all these different patterns and you can envision in your mind a little repetitive piece of DNA between each one of these numbers. So each one of these spacer numbers is a unique sequence that's only found in a particular um, pattern. So we have three regions, one, two, and three. The good news is, is that for pattern three or CR3, there's only one pattern and that just means you have Irwinia amylava, the fire blight pathogen. And so, for example, this one, if we were to get an uh, isolate from your orchard that murdered your, your murdered, murdered your trees, I mean, we could sequence it and find out, does it have one through 35 or is it missing something? And if it was missing number 58, yeah, you're actually a spacer pattern 42. Um, and we keep finding new spacers. The more Isabella keeps sequencing, new spacers are showing up, allowing us to have new patterns, which shows that we're probably in the center of origin and evolution for the fire blight pathogen. So we use pattern two, and then we use one in CRISPR region two, and then in many instances, 23 is a popular one. You can see that it's missing some, it's lost some, or it's more evolutionarily old, if you will. And then you pair this with silly pattern three, and we get these silly three number patterns like you might've seen in the good fruit growers. And it's basically telling us which pattern of all these different fingerprints is the isolate in your order. And in this particular instance, we're looking at pattern 2, 23, 38. And so if you've seen mention of these patterns, you can just imagine Isabella going through and looking to see which of the different spacers are presence and absence and assigning it a whole new pattern for the system. And as we go into more remote areas, particularly in eastern New York, we're finding different strains 
and, and different isolates and that we've never seen before and new spacers as we're getting closer and closer to that sort of center of origin, if you will. So what do we do in general? And uh, Isabel is going to go over this again in depth, but I don't think I can say it enough. No matter how many times I present this slide, a lot of people think we've got two monkeys picking ticks off each other's backs in a box. And that's how we come up with how your orchard is um, resistant or not. So we're going to go through this and I'm going to tell you what we actually do. We collect the samples. Then we isolate onto this selective media and it will make a cratered colony um, such as the one showed here. Oh, other labs don't necessarily test onto this, but we're so paranoid of getting the wrong organism and telling you it's resistant. Uh, Liga mentioned earlier, we noticed that epiphytes go resistant in your orchard in about three applications. Those are epiphytes of other bacteria. What you don't want us to do is plate some other random bacteria on a media and say, oh, you got strep resistance when you just have something else like pseudomonas that isn't actually going to kill your crop, but is frequently and very commonly resistant to streptomycin. So we got to put it on this media, see that it looks normal, see that it's cratering like it should. Once that's done, um, we actually will grow, we'll call this process phenotyping. That means we're going to grow the bacteria in the presence of streptomycin. Not only does it have to grow, it's got to grow fast as another resistant standard isolate. So we take some of the original ones from 2002, we put them right next to it. We take another one that has a different type of mutation, we watch them all grow. And if they all grow at the same speed, bam, um, then we know we have a potential problem. And then after that, and I'm going to talk about the genotyping at the very end of this segment, we're going to go ahead and we're going to sequence part of the chromosome. We're going to sequence those satellite pieces of DNA that are present in the organism. And we're going to see that everything, yes, it grows in streptomycin. Yes, it has the genes. And then finally, um, it's very expensive, but we can do that weird fingerprinting type technology on your isolates to figure out where it came from, where its origin is. Or is it something new or is it one that keeps getting moving around the state? And now that we've brought on Isabella, she's become a master of QGIS mapping, and she'll be able to show you some of the really cool things you can do in terms of looking at your orchard or how we can map the presence of these isolates over the state. Some of these slides, I, um, interestingly enough, the only people that are ever interested in this are the U.S. government and apple growers. And a lot of these slides I talked at the Presidential Advisory Council on Antimicrobial Resistance. And... Um, these are some of the types of things we showed. In the early years, we had a red period where we were finding a lot of problems in 2011, 2012, 2013, but not 2014. Um, New York growers seem to be very responsive. We seem to act to problems before they become incredibly widespread. And so in these early years, um, the moment we had this detection, growers were rotating everything, alternating, doing mixtures, all the stuff I'm gonna talk about in the management section. And um, it seemed as if we were wiping the stuff out by 2014. So what we did find in this period, we only found about 32 isolates. That's not much at 19 farms. And, you know, we're testing hundreds. So that means that an individual farm, you may have only had one or two resistant isolates in a population of troublemakers. That means you're back at that stage where you just have a few and then you can kill it by alternating your uh, various um, bacterial cytal materials. Um, this strain here, and you've probably seen this if you saw the Grid Fruit Grower Oracle or article. This one with the CRISPR pattern 412338 is the original strain we found in New York, and it was hiding out in the area as well. And then you can see there's a bunch of different weird patterns in the sensitive strains, a bunch of wild isolates that are present in our region. And then, of course, at some farms, we found isolates that are both resistant and sensitive but had the same profile, which makes you think, wait a minute, maybe they erode somehow on the farm. We'll talk about how the um, resistance can arise and the types of resistance we have um, shortcoming. And then uh, later on, we had a nice period of, we kept testing a lot of different isolates, found not a lot. And so we had some pretty nasty weather in 2018, uh, to end of 2018 and 2019 and 2020. And that's when we started seeing resistance again when Anna was part of the team. And in this particular instance, we found about 70 isolates on 11 farms and 27 distinct strain profiles. Look at all these crazy new profiles we're constantly finding, meaning we're having a lot of strain variety in the region. Strain variety is good because that means 
they can all compete with the resistant one that we're seeing right here. This is the only one we were finding at that point was that same original strain just sort of making its way um, out and about and all over the area itself. And then you can see some of her stuff here. This is the AMR strain here, and you can see where it was more frequently in Ontario and Wayne. But as we're doing a lot of the other states, parts of the states, that's where you're going to see these other strange, different strains that are our nice natural competitors. Yes, that's great that they compete with streptomycin resistance, but strains, but they can also kill your orchard, which is nothing that we want. So let's talk a little bit about the, the frustrating and complicated genetics of the system. Luckily, since we have this fairly long webinar, I'm allowed to go very slowly instead of like lightning speed at a, at a winter fruit school. Okay, so there are two different types of resistance thus far. There are these two genes, um, they're called STIR A and B. These genes are also present in medicine systems. They're also in other bacteria and medicine and vet, but they're referred to by different names. You might see them as their other names. At one point, Anna and I were getting into the medicine and food science and vet stuff, and we're like, what are these genes? Like, oh, turns out they're the same ones. So what these two genes do is they make a protein in the bacterium. They encounter the streptomycin molecule, and they break it, basically. They inactivate the streptomycin molecule, which means you think, well, wait a minute. What if we could just turn those genes off in the bacterium? Would they be able to break down streptomycin? No, they wouldn't work. If they were some way to inactivate them in the bacterium, it just wouldn't be able to inactivate streptomycin. So what these do is the bacterium then makes these products that come out and they inactivate streptomycin. They're really big pieces. We're not talking about single mutations in a single base pair in a single gene. We're talking about large chunks, lengths, many hundreds of base pair changes would be need to be uh, present to create these types of things. They're very large by comparison to the other methods we're going to see. And as my friend Frank Zell in Washington says, I, we never really tried to use the word moderate, and maybe I should have never used it because now you're like moderate. I'm going to go kill it. Um, no, don't do that. Don't start spraying strep like crazy. But it only really provides resistance up to about 200 parts per million. And what I think might have happened is on a really year where we have not a lot of fire blight pressure and everyone's doing their strep sprays, um, you know, none of these things got a foothold because you're probably getting good coverage, the pressure's low, and, you know, that 200 parts per million was probably knocking these guys out of the ballpark in a really easy year. And those really nasty years, we started seeing it again because they were part of the population, but in the really tough years, that just wasn't cutting it and we needed to do more so to speak. So this is what they do. Two genes that break streptomycin molecules. They're pretty big and they only give us a, a moderate amount of streptomycin. This is more than what would need to be done at a label rate unless you're making a very concentrated application. Now to make things Matt, more interesting, these two things here are even on a bigger piece of DNA. They're stuck on what is something called a transposable element or jumping gene. That used to be something that was originally discovered in corn but these two inactivating enzymes are now on a jumping gene or a transposable element, which means eerily and scarily enough, they can jump around, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but more on an evolutionary time scale type basis. So um, this is sort of one of the first sort of schematic of how I'm going to just show you all the different pieces of these types of things. So we'll just envision this as your bacterium cell, the big red line. And this is your major chromosome. And we'll talk about what this gene is next. This is your gene that streptomycin binds to and murders um, the, any bacteria that there exists in the world. It's the RPSL gene. We'll talk about it on the next slide. But in Michigan, and they all air fire blight, uh, so let's have this plasmid called PEA29. It's just a plasmid in there. And if there's no streptomycin resistance on it, it doesn't do anything for antibiotic resistance. But in the early days of Michigan, and their first encounters with this, they've ended up finding these two genes, plunk, stuck on this jumping gene on a different plasmid called EA234. Now, the interesting thing about this one is this plasmid can be passed along to other bacteria, meaning that if this bacterium over here found a healthy un, one that didn't have 34, it could be like, hey, let me give you 34, and you can inactivate streptomycin to your heart's content. And this one here can't really be passed around. It's stuck inside the bacterium. It, we got something on that, nothing's going to happen. Later, 
at some point in evolutionary history in Michigan, this P, this transposable jumping gene with the two genes of streptomycin activation on it made a hop between plasmids. And it happened in two different lineages in Michigan, it seems. It hopped from PA34 in two different places. It might be stuck there and the other one might be stuck there. But once it makes it onto this, this piece of DNA can't be passed between bacterium to bacterium. The only way to pick this thing up and get it somewhere else is to move that bacterium from one orchard to another, which means this sort of whole construct has to be passed around itself. The other thing that's going to happen is that no matter how many chemicals we spray on our orchard, the streptomycin and the chemicals that we're putting on to kill things aren't going to synthesize a 7KB genetic fragment. That would be like the most miraculous thing that ever occurred. So when we're spraying, we can't create this. If it's present, it can be selected for. But since we have this type of thing, there'd be so many genetic changes and they would never all occur. This thing has to be moved around physically. Now, what are the other sources? This stuff has happened in other places as well. Um, in California only, we still see the jumping gene combo, but it's stuck on a completely different plasmid. And to our knowledge, we don't have this weird PEU30. That one seems like a European plasmid just based on the name. Maybe it's your opinion. I don't know. We're not going to go there. Um, or it could just be Irwinia something with a U. Um, and also in California, there's it's stuck without the jumping gene component on a different plasmid. And then finally, uh, you can even find the whole jumping gene complex in one or two instances in Michigan just stuck on the whole bacterial chromosome. So there's a pantheon of these different things. But for the most part, in New York, we have this. And this has to be physically moved or it has to be in the orchards presently at low populations and we have to select it like in Liga's diagrams. Now, the second thing that can happen is something happens on the main gene. Boop. So this gene here called RPSL, you might hear us talking about mutations in it, and it's a gene that codes a ribosomal protein. In order for bacteria to make proteins grow and live and do stuff in your orchard and kill your plants, they have to make proteins. And in order to do that, they need ribosomes. And so what happens is the streptomycin molecule binds to this S12, which is encoded by this gene, and stops the bacteria from making any proteins whatsoever, and they all die. Um, they can't do anything. So streptomycin comes in and will land right there. Sadly, you can get a single base pair mutation, and this can occur naturally in a population. It, you know, you, this is only one change. This is not 7,000 base pair changes all in a perfect order. This is just one single change. And that mutation change will cause one of the amino acids to go from a K to an R, which is why that's got that strange designation. K becomes an R. And in that particular instance, the streptomycin can no longer bind to the chromosome and it can't kill the bacterium. Can you get both? I'm sure you probably could, but let's not even think about a super bacterium. This one will provide an incredibly high level resistance. You know, in the other ones, if we go back here, um, streptomycin can still bind here, but these two genes are making molecules that break it. You can think about it like that. Once it here, this happens, strep can never bind and stop the bacterium from growing. This one is rate dependent. This one is the end of days, if you will. You can put on 2,500 parts per million. You can basically make a media that is streptomycin and the things like, great, I can use this. Um, and that's where the scary part comes. And a lot of this application was believed this was probably the one that was created or selected for very easily by post pedophile applications because you only need one change. Now, you can still select for post pedophile applications if you have the other thing present in your orchard. But if you don't, nowhere, not even in low levels, this is the type of thing you'd see. It's really present in Oregon, Washington, Utah, Idaho, low instances in California, Michigan, and New York. We found one. And you could imagine this one being the one here, like, yep, okay, if I had this in low uh, populations and I made 15 post um, bloom sprays, bam, we would see this. Now, however, this little booger, um, this one has the possibility of a natural arising in a population. Now, this combo, we'll indicate it by a cute red dot, um, has to come in in order for it to be selected. It, it has to be there or it has to have been brought in one way or another. And, you know, now, even Dave Rosenberger and I are thinking that some of these big 
statewide storms at some point could blow something around. The only reason I say that is because that's happened with the citrus industry in um, early on for a citrus canker, which is another bacterium disease and hurricanes would come through and blow the stuff everywhere and redistribute um, troublesome um, strains of the citrus canker pathogen. And, you know, maybe now it wasn't always moved by people. It might've been moved by local large storms. Um, particularly we, if we have some that ex expand the entire Rochester Buffalo region, some of that stuff could happen. But this one, in order to get it, you gotta, it has to come into the population. Oop. This one probably could arise naturally and be selected with post bloom applications. And but right now, this is what we're finding everywhere in New York. We've got this thing that has to enter one way or another. So if you don't have it and you could have magical ability never to say like it's not in our population at all. The only way it's going to get in there is if you have something else with a 34 that it hops from. Um, but for the most part, this is what we're finding all stuck there on plasma 29. Um, there's a lot of genetic testing that can be done to determine this, but it's all very expensive and takes time um, and effort and a lot of money. And then the question becomes like, okay, great, and all these silly genetic determinants, what do we do to beat this thing? How do we kill it? And I'm going to go through in this next section of it before we get into the discussion and talk to you how, what are our best managed, what I recommend everyone, every other plant pathologist in the Northeast is going to disagree with me in one way or another, but you know what, do what works best on your farm. Don't listen to any of us. Um, what I like to start with is um, if you can and you have the labor and it's obvious, prune out the cankers and then start your copper. Here at FRU, um, I noticed, I don't know if it was a mistake or whatever, but they've been doing copper to half inch green. My apples look great. And I think it might, those extra couple sprays of copper might do well for um, fire blight. So even after looking at my spray logs, kind of adopted that as how I would proceed in my own orchards, bringing that copper right in there, maybe not too far, but that second spray. Maybe your first one is like late silver tip and your second one is between the two. But um, we've been going pretty hard with two co-sides. Then, obviously, as you creep into bloom, and we'll go through each of the stages, you can use your antibiotics or your biologicals, depending on how you need. And then now it's becoming very popular to do defense inducers. And then ProHex, you know, two weeks, sort of the standard petal in two weeks later. But now we've got all this sort of pre-bloom efforts for ProHex. And particularly, if you're putting on a high rate of ProHexidione calcium for bitter pit and Honeycrisp, this is not going to hurt your fire blight. If anything, it's going to help it based on some of the research that um, Anna has done. So going through it in a nutshell, I think doing all these practices are perfect. So we're recommending preseason dilute, dilute, delay dormant, fix copper application. Make sure to really soak it into those cracks and crevices. This warm weather might cause things to ooze and that fire blight will increase. And we have at least 15% metallic copper equivalent or higher. And this is the one to really get clunked all over the, um, all over the tissues because you're not as worried about the um, phytotoxicity. And you know, maybe do that light silver and then maybe green to pink going with that and saving a little bit of your cap 10 Mancozeb type materials for later on in the season. Then a tight cluster to pink I'm really leaning towards the pink application because that sort of matches up better with some of the other recommendations that we've seen throughout the country and also matches up for Dan's recommendation for um, bitter pit on Honeycrisp. And in our case, we're just recommending like if it's a pretty well-established tree, if it's a big tree like the one in the picture, which none of you should be growing, probably going to need to do a lot more than six ounces per hundred, but like a standard vertical access to really fat looking super spindle. Uh, six ounces per hundred. Alternatively, my colleague George Sundin has pioneered a program where you're looking at two ounces per hundred plus one ounce per hundred of ActGuard, and that's worked really well in Michigan. I brought that program here, and it's worked really well here, and this was another really nice option if you have really small trees. There seems to be a synergy between these two materials in terms of cell wall thickening as well as defense inducing. So that's a pretty nice one as well. And with really young trees, that's not a bad one. So if you want to start off, start at pink with this. And the idea being is that this will thicken the cell walls in the part that goes from the flower to your stem and stop the systemic invasion. So what fire blade does is it gets in there. That's great. But it sticks a straw into your cells and it poops out all of these nasty things 
these warfare chemicals that will cause your cells to decay and rot, which is why it turns black. And as they're rotting, what that does is it gets the fire blight even crazier and energizes it and it moves really, really fast to the vascular tissue. Then the next thing you know, you got oozing fruit and death all over your small trees. But what this, these types of materials do is they try to thicken. It's a PGR, it tries to thicken that cell wall to keep that straw from punching all the way through. Um, think of it as when you try to put a straw in a coconut. Yeah, it doesn't work. Um, you're going to coconut your plant cell walls. That's sort of the idea. Uh, you can see some pictures here of some of Anna's stuff right there. And, you know, she sliced this. And we're looking to see, like, can we stop that straw from bacteria running around in here, get it so thick that it can't inject its effectors and tear stuff up. So it bloom, obviously. You could use the newer model, but what I recommend is also let Mike and Janet run the newer model and provide you really specific evidence. Use your consultant. Look at all the extension alerts. Read our silly blog. Maybe listen to the podcast that Monique wants to do with us this, um, this week and next week and stuff like that. Look at all the disease model forecasts and periods and newest. So start looking at this ahead of time. The one thing that ends up happens is models will seem to overpredict infection risk. If I've learned anything, you get a bunch of really cold weather periods and um, bloom can sometimes go by pretty quickly. Even if it sort of stalls out, if it's so cold and bloom is hanging on, you're not going to get a fire blight infection. Don't save all your best materials and sprays strep eight times. Save them. You shouldn't really need too many more than three good applications to get to petal fall and then try to finish strong. I'll talk about that. You really just need one well-timed application. The, good, the bad news is you don't know when that one is. You can get a hint from the models, but you don't know if it's going to be in the middle or right at the end. And some days it looks like it's going to get worse at the end. Anytime you're looking at a model, use common sense um, at that particular instance. Use common sense and your consultant and your extension person. If something doesn't look right, don't make an application. Ask for a clarification. There all three of us have emails. Um, we can look at the models as well. They're going to do some crazy stuff. The great news is, as Liga already showed you this, we have a new model. Um, we got the newest version of Cougar Blight from WSU. It works on a daily basis, just like... Uh, Mary Blight. And then we have the Mary Blight epiphytic infection potential type stuff. It all gets squished into one system. And as you know, it's fully automated. You can find it. And as we're looking here, when you're looking at for um, streptomycin and kasugamycin, you can really play with that EIP number being 100. Now, one thing that's going to happen, particularly with the epiphytic infection potential or Mary Blight, is it could get so cold at night, your EIP goes over 100, but the risk factor which is how these things are determined, will make it less risk. In that instance, you probably could get away with an EIP of 100 and a biological. Now, the Cougar Blight, and even the new version, will own, doesn't really take into account um, evening cool periods, as far as I know. I mean, it is at some level, because it's taking hourly data, but um, it's not going to drop back down the risk. The uh, risk prediction, the color of the bar, and um, the epiphytic infection potential, or the Mary Blight model, is really dependent on other factors other than just the EIP. So you can be like, why do I have 110, and such as in this graph right there? But it's, uh, it's only orange. And that's because they probably had some cold weather at night, and so that's what's going on. So if you're managing a lot of things early on, 40 to 70 is a good uh, application window for a biological or oxytet. It's not as strong as Liga mentioned against these materials. So this is what I'm thinking, and we should probably do. If you don't have a streptomycin resistant Irwinia or on their farm, fire blight, you should do everything you can to protect yourself from future outbreaks. A lot of these materials weren't like my the brainchild of my brain. It was Debbie Breath, Julie Carroll, and George Sundin, and I all sat down and he said, here's what I think New York should do. And I'm like, okay, this makes sense to me. Um, and these are some of the things that we did do when we had all those nice blue years in between all of the periods of red antibiotic resistance taxes. We mixed streptomycin and oxytet at the full rate each. That's expensive. But even those two mixed together probably weren't as expensive as casugamycin. We alternate with casugamycin. One thing that we've learned is that for the longest time, only George Sundin and I could get casugamycin to work. What I noticed is that New York's often cloudy. And in other places like Pennsylvania and other things, it gets super sunny. It turns out that casugamycin can break down in sunlight pretty easy. So if you're going to use this one, alternating with it, 
even because you're just protecting yourself from the future. You don't have it, but you want to save your orchard for the future and save our industry. Go on cloudy days or evenings. The other thing that we've learned is that populations tend to spike at night based on some new research out of Michigan. And, you know, the closer you get to the evening, the probably the better bang for your buck that you're going to get on murdering these things. The third option is just to alternate with Oxytet if you didn't use it in the mix. If you're already mixing the two together, you don't need to keep alternating with it. Coppers or a biological of interest such as Blossom Protector, one of the other antimicrobial biologicals that I constantly talk about at um, the fruit schools. Now, ugh, this is where things get scary. If you do have it on the farm, um, you pay the big bucks and you start right off i mean you start with the first big nasty period you don't start it right oh no i got king bloom and it's 10 degrees outside don't spray then wait till the first big new period and then you go in with your casugamycin make sure your sprayer is super calibrated make sure it's not bright and sunny or you go at night and you let it have it or you can go with blossom protect and buffer protect as long as you're not planting a super high russet variety now early on in the season this stuff isn't going to get in there and russet your fruit. As you creep through the end in paddle fall, things get scarier. You can use oxytetracycline or biopesticide copper. Don't skimp on the rate. And if you are using new forecasts with these less effective materials, you might do need to make more applications. Every time, oh no, 60 to 100 EIP with wet weather at bloom, um, use the most local data as you possibly can, and then um, pick your favorite materials that work best and mix well on your farm and go for them. It's pretty good if you don't want to use this, like you have Miniesca or something like that, and you don't want to use Blossom Protect on it. Or maybe it's cheaper than Kasugam Um, yeah, You don't know. Uh, they might cost the same. Um, at least you don't have to put one in the fridge um, in that particular instance, which is sort of my problem at work. Okay, finally, the other things I'm going to recommend. Know is what you do if you have yes or no. And then, of course, things seem to spike at night. Go for those evening applications. Two reasons. If it's spiking, you're hitting it hard and then helps avoid a breakdown by solar energy. Don't forget, may not be that just casugamycin breaks down in the sunlight. Ever got a bottle of antibiotics liquid from the doctor when your kid was sick? What did they tell you to do? They didn't say leave it outside in the sunlight that's in some kind of coated container that's blocking light and they tell you to stick it in the fridge. Um, that's to avoid breakdown. So if you go out night when it's cool and there's no sun, you're probably going to get better things. There are sunscreen adjuvants. I think I've tried some, but I always get kasugamycin to work. So in that case, um, I can't tell if it did help or not. And then finally, one of the things that's been really nasty in the last couple of years, particularly in Western New York, not always in Eastern New York, because you're already way past this point by then, um, is we're starting to get, we got the bloom, everything looks great. I made 15 applications to strep when I didn't need it. And then all of a sudden petal fall comes and then there's this massive extreme weather condition and we're all, and that's where everything is lost particularly in the Finger Lakes region. This is sort of what we hit last year. And these types of things can change just on a daily basis by cultivar. If one cultivar sneaks into pedophile just a day or two early, it might dodge a lot of this type of stuff. And so um, watch it carefully. But I've been thinking if you're going to have this hot weather right at pedophile, look and see how many rat tail bloom you still have on the plant. Like, yep, still got flowers on the tree. I'm going for it. And um, don't let the hot weather at pedophile um, cause you to lose your entire orchard later on. So after all of that's over, well, you survive bloom and your orchard doesn't look like mine. Right there, look at that nasty thing. Yeah, that's disgusting. Um, you come back, if you did the two-in-one program early on at Pink, um, George and I are recommending that you come back and hit it again right at Petal Fall and maybe even 10 to 14 days later. If your plants aren't slowing down, you can do the six ounces per hundred as well, depending on how big your tree is. If your plants aren't slowing down, then this material isn't going to work for you. If they're incredibly low vigor and you don't really see any change, you're probably not getting any change at a cellular level. You know, the plant has to be ready and moving in order to sort of process this material. That's what it's doing, preventing that invasion. We talked about that. It also slows the growth of trees. If you don't see your tree growth slowing, you're probably just flushing your PGR. The other thing you can do is once you hit the summer, thank goodness, um, if your all your orchard is going to die, you can use copper and protect it. And there's organics, coppers, and all kinds of stuff. And many of the low rate MCE coppers, you can kind of put on. And if they're low enough and they're protected enough, they don't often damage the fruit. Um, if you're just trying to save the day, 
don't worry about russeting whatsoever. If you are worried about fruit russeting, make sure you do it on a, this is the time you do want to do it on a sunny, dry day. So you get that great drying weather. Things cause more damage when they're concentrated on the fruit surface and it's slow drying conditions. So now you're going to flip the, the spectrum. You're not going to go for the, the overcast day for this. You want this to quickly dry so you don't damage stuff in that particular instance. Copper is only going to protect against surface bacteria. It's not going to get deep in the plant and save and knock your plant out. Whoops, that was what the apogee was going to do. The only bad thing that happens as your plants grow, the new terminal won't have copper on it. And if that terminal whaps into another branch with fire blight, you're in super trouble. And that's where bad things happen. And so you kind of need to move this on these fixed programs until the, um, the bud set. And that's sort of what we're doing. If you're going to prune, uh, um, it looks like vertical axis might be the best bet or really large trees that are almost as large as a vertical axis tree stuck in the middle of a high density planting. The bigger the tree, I'm probably going to say about four to six centimeters might give you some benefit from pruning. We've been trying a lot of pruning on really tiny trees, and that's just been a, a, a disaster because the fire blight is running through it like a log flume ride at a Six Flags. It is just ripping through the trees super fast. If you do do it, cool, dry day. Fire blight likes hot. Um, in this case, overcast is good. Cut at least into last season's growth into healthy tissue. And if you're in the young tree and you're already in the main scaffold, I would say pull it before it becomes a sprinkler system of fire blight with the next rain. And then once you do prune, if you have the capacity, maybe put something like a copper on that pruning wound. Try to get it out of there. There is a rescue program that Surgeon and I used to talk about. Um, yeah, it's rough. You put on a lot of pro hex, hope it works, hope it stops the tree growth, wait five days. Because if you put it on the shoot, immediately cut it out, it didn't do anything for your tree. Um, and then prune every two weeks, you might have to do it again. I feel like every time in Geneva, we're just constantly running a rescue program and failing. Um, you might be able to save the trees, but they're going to look really awful. And they're going to be a nasty source of inoculum. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this. We've hit the final section where... The only time we get funding is Apple Research Development, New York Farm Viability, and any time I carry a backpack and spray stuff for the chemical money. And this is my team right there from this summer. And Mike, I'm going to stop sharing, and we can discuss or go to the next phase. All right. Thank you very much, Carrick. Thank you, Liga. So I'm going to open it up. We've got plenty of time for discussion and questions. So if folks do have questions, and again, we do have plenty of time, so please do go ahead and type those into the chat box. and. We'll go ahead and ask them. It looks like we see something about coppers. For my early coppers, I like your coast side. I, I mean, a lot of them are copper hydroxides. They're your, your coast sides, your um, badges um, for early on. And later on, a lot of the other alternative coppers, like the CS2005. Do I still like Howler? Yeah, I've never quit liking Howler. I've only tried it the last two years. It's been a pretty nice product. It's one of those biopesticides. Don't wait for your EIP to hit 120 in a rain event before using Howler. Go, you know, lean on that like 60 to 100 if you want to use a biopesticide. It does mix well. I did see one earlier, Carrick. Yep. I think this might have been for Liga's part of the conversation. I think it was on either your, your Kasuga or your Oxytet slide. Um, someone was asking about what is translation? Let's see which one of translation. What do you see it do? Uh, hmm. Oh, yeah, translation. Yep, so that goes back to, yep, that's exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. Translation is the biological process of taking the message of the protein and making a protein. So what this does is it stops the bacteria from making proteins and then dies. Yep dies um i think that is indeed done copper and i've seen people mix copper and oil and um I, usually the oil is dilute then the copper might be dilute yeah i don't know yeah i've seen people do that i've never and i don't know if i would do copper and oil the second spray but um maybe the just the first we've got another question carrick uh yep. what about fun jout oh i've used it before um I've seen it, man. I mean, fire blight's not hard to kill. Um, I don't know if I would roll hard with, with fung out, um, with, you know, it's like 300 EIP and 500, you know, use them as a biological. It should do things. Yeah. 
it's like it's it's really easy to kill the fire blight cells. Um, but then again, if too much gets through, you got a big thing. Most of you, what was 40, 38. Whoops, 39 might have been a typo. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep, should be 38. Yep, 38 is the, the CRISPR region three designation for Arwenia. Let's go ahead and change that right now. We've got another question, Carrick. Any data on fruit rusting by variety for those summer copper sprays? Yeah, I mean, we've not seen it. One of the things that we did um, in particular, there was a lot of concern of Provisto, which I found really works really well during bloom for fire blight. One time I was given the, the material non-identified and I thought it was an antibiotic and it worked so well. Um, we So we did Provisto on a block that's got a lot of Susan's advanced varieties in it and many other things, New York 1, 2, and uh, a couple other ever crisp and a bunch of stuff and we've we sprayed it all summer long to try to save our plantings and i yeah firecracker cordero and we never saw any trouble with that one i think as long as you're using an appropriate volume of water if you're trying to cover your orchard in like 20 gallons and you put all the big heavy copper in it you might and it's slow drying conditions you might see trouble but a lot of these coppers that have labels for post bloom use are pretty all right like provisto is very liquidy cs2005 sort of just rolls off the plant um I mean, you know you don't you're not worried so much about fire blight getting into the apples themselves and so and then that can't you really want it on the the, the the leaf tissue so um you don't really need it sticking around a lot particularly if you're going to go every year and there's no strep resistance no need for blossom protect you don't have to do it uh yeah yeah what you say is fine if you don't have strep resistance um it would be good to rotate materials maybe put in one jennifer if you can afford it i was talking with tom burr about this and he's like you know it was my block i would rotate one kasugamycin to make sure i never saw all the stupid stuff ever in my entire life um so once it gets i mean uh, it can come in who knows how or why but once it's there it's trouble yeah you could as long as you got the copper will kill it the actor guard will kill it and potentially even a biolog oh you have a cider tree oh. and <laughs> never mind um geez cider tree is kind of like tissue paper for fire blight um you can spray it like crazy and i don't think it cares i think it's just so fast and so susceptible it's like yeah put it all on me you'll kill most of us one of us is going to get through and just wipe your cider tree out right it doesn't regulate it i think that could also help as well um, I know I'm not a pH spray person, but I, I, I think making sure the pH is appropriate can definitely help with injury. And whatever nonsense pH water is in our spray tank here seems to be working great because we don't ever see a lot of damage no. unless it's powdery mildew. Um, spray resistant, consuming a bloom, ActiGuard Pro Hex, pink. Um, blossom Protect at what timing? Um, you could, I wouldn't mind, I would put one in. Um, a Blossom Protect could be one of the bloom sprays that you use with Kasumin. You could just put it in once. And, you know, you may, I would go like lean, maybe it's 60% bloom, Chris. That way you get um, a couple of days or like look at the model. And if you're like 50% bloom and it's going to get real hot, put it on about three or four days ahead of time. And evidence suggests that it is doing defense and maybe clog, it's not clogging as much. And so I would sort of save that for my middle of my program sort of to get a little bit of the uh, early colonization coverage and others. Uh, many, oh, no, it's no, the, the Sweet Tango seems to have more phytotox. And the reason I say that is because we did a study with uh, uh, parents not too long ago looking at like, oh gosh, one of the PGRs, one of them and trying to stop russeting on Sweet Tango. And the organism that we were pulling off of it is the active ingredient in Blossom Protect. And so, I mean, already's going to have a lot of that on there, but um, don't splay blossom protect that petal fall. You want, I would leave that sort of that middle one. In like Chris's case, I'd hit it with Kasumin, go blossom protect in the middle as you creep into the 80% bloom. And if it gets really hot, smash it with Kasumin again. Yeah. And then do your coppers and your app and your anything that slows down and turns on your defenses. And, and then keep your fingers crossed and hope you're not growing cider varieties. I keep right, telling I, Greg we got to find a resistant cider variety, and he's like, "There is no such thing." Shut up! No, <laughs> he doesn't say that part. 
Well, I'll keep the chat box open a little bit okay. longer if anybody else has any other questions. Right. Um, Carrick, one that I had is just that that question of to prune or not to prune. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard some concerns. If I, if I go in and prune, you know, before we hit terminal bud set, is that going to force the tree to grow more? And then yep. am I going to have even more to cut out? So what's, yep. what's sort of your take on that? Yep. So um, I, I would say based on some of the work that Isabella and I are doing that um, pruning, very vigorous, small super spindle trees is probably a waste of your time and money unless you're pruning them off at the trunk and um if you have a bigger tree i'd say four to six centimeters in diameter you can get some benefit from it but it is going to flush that growth again um we did the study where we tried putting on the uh pro hex before and after to try to slow it down yeah it doesn't um seem to be statistically relevant and how how it does i mean the older trees will grow more slowly anyway so um just watch your vigor you might have to do it service is oxytech started to come for the past two years of pandemic oh most of my population are still susceptible just say not use strep this song uh let's see you're saying do not use strep if at all there is some resistance i would i mean if you're still doing the mix and you're happy um bob um uh, i would say it's probably fine to keep doing your mix especially if you're hitting it with a full rate and, and you're still clean that's i mean that's an option we even recommended it in the early days for um strep resistance as well in general anytime you use it it might select something but if the oxytet if you're feeling that the oxytet is working for you as your resistance management partner at a technical level you would be fine um yep but for the most part i'd like i'd maybe switch away from it if you can, or maybe just one application, but if you're putting in all the other stuff, um, you're going to get more resistance management of any escapes. And if you're clean, maybe don't go back to just strep, just stick to the strep oxy. We had another question right before oh. that, Carrick. Is lifeguard worth Life using? Using, I get great use with it, but no one else does. Um, uh, I would say that combination is definitely less effective than Blossom Protect. When Ben Gutierrez says, how do we save the germplasm repository? Um, we went copper and blossom protect, and that's what we're doing um, this year for them. And that's how I feel like we've been able to keep the trees alive is their team going hard on copper, going hard on blossom protect. So that's my like, like organic copper blossom protect is my organic program of like good stuff. Um, I've had good luck with Rosagalia and CS2005 as well. It's another combo, but Blossom Protect I like because not only has it worked in my trials, it's worked in California, Oregon, North Carolina, well, maybe not Pennsylvania, other states that test fire blight materials except Pennsylvania, Michigan, obviously Michigan. Yep. Good thing. All right. Thank you, Kirk. Good. <laughs> I don't see any other questions coming in Great. right now. So I think with that, um, I think, why don't we go ahead and we're going to shift to phase two. Isabella give a talk yep. about her, the sample submission and the sampling network this year. Yep. All right. Yep. Show them all the stuff. Do you need all right, to just, regulate the strap? Oh, we'll answer that later. Oh, uh, just, I guess. Okay. Um, I'm going to send a couple of links to the chat just before I um, get started with the presentation, because I'm going to mention them later on and I want to make sure everybody has access to them. All right, does everything look good on the Zoom end? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, great, I'll get started. Uh, so like Tarek and Mike said, I'm gonna be talking about sample submission and our sampling efforts for resistance determination in fire blight in the upcoming growing season. So just a brief outline of my presentation, I'm gonna talk about some of the resistance mechanisms that Carrick and Liga mentioned in their presentation. I'm going to talk about what we observed in 2020, 2021, and 2022. And then I'm going to talk about our surveying efforts going into this season. And we're gonna start with the resistance mechanisms. So Carrick talked about different mechanisms of streptomycin resistance, and I'm just gonna to touch upon, again, the two that we find in New York State. One is the mutation in the RPSL gene, which converts a lysine to an arginine. This inhibits streptomycin from binding to the ribosome, um, and this prevents streptomycin from impeding protein production. So it makes a change that essentially renders the streptomycin ineffective. 
The other mechanism of resistance, and actually one we see most commonly, at least in our sampling efforts, is a linked pair of genes. This is STIR A and STIR B, and they can be found on transposon TN5393A, which is found on the plasmid PEA29. And this pair of genes encode for phosphotransferases, and these modify streptomycin into a non-toxic form, which also prevents it from impeding the ribosome activity. And again, this, con this plasmid is non-conjugative, meaning that it's not going to move around. There are other plasmids that can move in between bacterial populations, but this one will remain in the bacteria in which it's found. So now that I've touched on those, I'm gonna go over the resistance survey between 2020 and 2022. So 2020 was, um, for anybody who was around for that season, it was not so great for Fireblade. There was a ton of disease pressure. We received 189 samples. This was my first season with the lab. Um, and I was told, you know, this is not necessarily a normal year. This is pretty heavy disease pressure. And 71 of those samples were found to be resistant. And those resistant strains were confined to Ontario and Wayne counties. So we received samples from 15 different counties, but only Ontario and Wayne in 2020 were found to have resistant fire blight. So Carrick talked a bit about the QGIS maps. So I'm going to have a bunch of maps in this presentation, just showing you um, sort of recaps from the different seasons. So this is 2020. Uh, you can see that Ontario and Wayne here are in dark purple, indicating that the fire blight was both susceptible and there was resistant fire blight. And then the light purple indicates that only susceptible fire blight was found in those counties. And this just shows the number of samples that we received from each county. So Ontario and Wayne definitely sent us the majority this year, but we did receive a couple of samples from throughout New York State. So out of 189 samples, 179 were streptomycin resistance tested, and the 71 resistant strains were again confined to Ontario and Wayne. In 2021, we had uh, much less disease incidents, which was great, and we received 66 samples, but a much greater percentage of the samples we received were found to be resistant. So 52 of the 66 were found to be resistant, and they were found in four out of the nine counties that we looked at. So Clinton, Ontario, Monroe, and New York counties. So here's uh, just a map representation of that information. Ontario and Wayne, again, had susceptible fire blight and resistance fire blight found. And then in Clinton, we had only resistant fire blight. And in New York County, somebody in New York City found an apple tree and was very curious. So they sent us some samples and we found resistant fire blight um, from that. And again, this is the number of samples. So even though there was resistance found in Clinton, we only received one sample. So even though with more samples, we have a greater chance of catching the resistance, sometimes it only takes one. So this past year, we received 104 samples and 37 of them were found to be resistant. So a lower percentage of the overall samples had resistance, but they were much more spread out than the past two years. So we found resistance in 10 out of the 12 townies tests 12 counties tested, excuse me. So we found them in Albany, Cortland, Dutchess, Orleans, Ontario, Saratoga, Tompkins, Ulster, Wayne, and Westchester. So pretty dispersed throughout New York. And again, here's a map. So a lot more dark purple spread throughout indicating that all of these counties had susceptible and resistant strains. And then Clinton, this past year, we did not find a resistant strain, and there was also not a resistant strain found downstate. And again, this is the number of samples we received per county. So sometimes, like I said, it really only takes one or two for us to find resistance, but the more samples we have from a county, the better idea we have of what's going on in that county overall. And again, these red circles are where the resistant strains were found. So these 37 resistant strains were spread throughout these 10 different counties. So a recap of all of our data collection um, and analysis, 361 samples were sent to us or collected by us between 2020 and 2022, and 226 of those were found to be resistant and spread throughout these 12 different counties. And this is a compiled map of the 2020, 2021, and 2022 data. 
So out of the 361 samples sent to us, 336 were streptomycin resistance tested and 266 were found to be resistant. And when we looked at the genetic mechanisms um, supporting that resistance, almost all of them were found to have STIR A and B, which is really interesting because in some other areas, RPSL mutation is more common and there are other plasmids, but it seems that at least in New York that the STIR A and B mechanism, at least in the samples we're receiving is definitely the most common. So just to go through where resistance was showing up over the course of these three years, in 2020, only in Ontario and Wayne, in 2021, Ontario and Wayne again, and then spread to Clinton and New York counties. And then again, this past year, we found it uh, much more spread out throughout New York. So I wanna talk briefly about a particular strain of fire blight that's 412338. And again, like uh, Carrick discussed in his presentation, these numbers are indicative of certain spacer patterns um, from CRISPR region one, CRISPR region two, and CRISPR region three. And this is a resistant strain, and this is by far the most common resistant strain we have found throughout New York over the years. So at least for now, it seems to be confined to Western New York. But the reason we do this CRISPR testing, you know, you might think, well, why is it important to have all of these profiles, especially if there's such a high diversity within the profiles and, you know, you're finding new spacers all the time and you're coming up with these new numbers. Um, it's because when we have something that's resistant and we know that at least for now, it's localized to Western New York. If it starts all of a sudden in the coming years to pop up um, in the Champaign Valley region, in Southern New York, in Orange County, in the Hudson Valley, then we know that there's either some kind of movement or contamination or something, something is going on. And we can use that information to investigate further. So in the history of our lab sampling, 72 samples have been found to have this profile, the 412338, and it's been found in 2002, 2012, and all the years between 2017 and 2022. So it's a pretty consistently appearing strain. And like Carrick mentioned, this is the first um, strain that was identified. So when the first resistant, the first resistant strain identified, excuse me. So when the first sample um, resistance sample was found and they looked to identify the CRISPR regions, it was 412338. So now that I've talked about um, what we've observed over the past three years, I'm going to talk about the survey going into this spring and summer. So something new that we're going to be offering growers and extension agents, we've always offered, well, Obviously, it's streptomycin resistance testing. We've always told you if the sample is, in fact, fire blight and if it is susceptible or resistant to streptomycin. But something new that we're going to be offering is a farm history. And this will be especially helpful for growers that have sampled with us for many years. So what this will provide is you will get a resistance history for your orchard or your growing operation. Um, it will tell you, you know, what samples have been susceptible, what, which ones have been resistant. In this case, none were resistant. And you'll also get a yearly history. So you'll see which samples correspond to which years. In this case, there was one unknown sample and one susceptible sample. Um, in earlier years, sometimes the testing was just done to confirm if there was in fact fire blight. It wasn't always done to determine resistance status. So that may be why there's an unknown. Uh, in 2014, they sent us a whole group of samples, all of which were susceptible. And then in 2020, um, there was another susceptible sample. So in this case, this particular operation has sent us samples over the course of three years and there was no resistance found. Another example is this growing operation that sent in many more samples, a total of 21. And we can see that there's many unknown and susceptible samples earlier on and the most recent two were resistant. And when we look at that compared to the years these samples were sent in, we can see in 2012, all susceptible or unknown, in 2014, the same, and the two samples that were sent in 2020 were found to be resistant. And this just shows the importance of year-to-year -year sampling. So even if you are finding only susceptible strains each year, it's still important to test because knowing the status of the particular population of fire blight um, in your growing operation will help inform your management practices. And just a third example, this one is kind of all over the place. There was resistance and susceptibility and unknown samples kind of spread out. And when we look at that 
um, in relation to the years, we see that almost all of these are from 2012. And then 10 years later, when this operation sent us samples again, we found one resistant and one susceptible sample. So who knows what you know the outcomes would have been had we received samples in between those years. But even if you have resistance, knowing where and in which blocks can really help optimize management. So just to recap of what's coming this, uh, this growing season. We are again, testing for streptomycin resistance. It's um, free as long as you send us the tissues, we will test it and we will get it back to you. You have the option to receive a farm history and that farm history is only sent to the grower that it pertains to. So it's confidential. We're not going to be dispersing that around. Um, even if resistance is not suspected, sampling is still helpful because it keeps you updated and gives you an idea of, oh. Oh, okay. Um, hope everything's all right. Um, so even if resistance is not suspected, sampling is still helpful. It gives you an idea of what is going on in your orchard right at this moment. And the more consistently an orchard is sampled, the more likely we are to catch the resistance before it becomes widespread. So knowing, you know, maybe you only had one sample that showed streptomycin resistance, but knowing that, hey, it's in this block, it's not in this other parts of my orchard yet, will help you um, contain it as quickly as possible. So I just want to go through the steps. Um, these are the same steps that Carrick went through in his presentation, but what do we do when we actually get your sample in the mail? So first is the sample collection, which is usually done by the grower, um, by the extension agent, or by us sometimes. And the most important part of sample collection is that we receive something that the bacteria are actively growing in. So no tissue that's already dead, no ooze that's already sort of dried out because when the tissue loses moisture, the bacteria move somewhere else to live. So if we receive something in the mail that's too dry or too dead, it's really hard to isolate the bacteria from. So if you send us a sample from the lower lesion margin, which is just the border of where the dead tissue meets the healthy tissue, so where the bacteria are actively growing and moving, that's a really great place to sample from. Um, and also anything with active ooze, so ooze that's in the white, yellow, orange color range, and also wrapping your tissue or your piece of fruit or leaf in a damp paper towel also helps to keep the tissues hydrated when they're in the mail on their way to us. So once we receive your sample, we work on pathogen isolation. Like Carrick and Liga mentioned, there are other things that grow in and on an apple tree that will have streptomycin resistance but aren't fire blight. So we make sure that we are in fact seeing fire blight and we wanna get it in a pure culture to ensure that we're not giving you guys false positives and false negatives because of some sort of contamination going on. Once we have it isolated, we look for streptomycin resistance. So just getting a yes or no, is it resistant, is it not? But then also looking for these different mechanisms. So determining which resistance mechanism does this particular strain have. Well then notify the grower. If you've opted to receive a farm history, you'll receive that as well. Otherwise you will just receive a notification if the sample you sent in was susceptible or resistant. And then we'll also do CRISPR strain tracking, which gives us an idea of how different strains are present in different counties throughout New York and hopefully using some bioinformatics um, in the upcoming years, we can get an idea of how strains may be spreading or moving throughout the state. And then again, this QGIS mapping, and I've had a lot of fun learning about this software and using it to create these maps and pictures. And this one is just of the number of different CRISPR strains we have found in these different counties. You can see between Ontario and Wayne, we have about 150 different CRISPR strains. So like Carrick said, within these regions, a high diversity, but among the resistant bacteria, it's a lot of the 41, 23, 38. So if you're interested in participating or continuing to participate in our streptomycin resistant survey, you can of course email me or Carrick or Liga, anybody at our lab. Um, I have these QR codes here if you want to take a screenshot, but I have also sent the links for these forms in the chat and you should have access to them. And I'm going to go over what these different forms are. So the first, um, the green barcode is the survey information form. And this gives you a play-by-play -play of how to collect the sample, um, what kind of sampling we do, why we do it. 
It tells you again to collect from the lesion margin, anything with active ooze. And then if you are interested in receiving a farm history before the growing season, so if you've sent us samples historically, we can provide that to you. Or if you're interested in sampling with us for the first time and receiving a farm history at the end of the season, we can do that as well. And you can also sign up for updates. So we will, at the end of the season, be sending out county level recaps of what we observed. The other form is the sample submission form. And this is the form that you're actually going to use if you want to mail us a sample. And it has information on how to label the package, how to label your sample. Um, and it also asks for quite a bit of data. And I just wanna talk about why that data is important because I'm sure it's it can seem a little arbitrary or just seem a little lengthy to have to fill out all these different um, pieces of information, but I wanna talk about how we use it to get you the most accurate up-to-date information on what's going on in your growing operation. So collector information and grower information are really important. This here is a map of just every sample our lab has ever received and processed. You can see there's tons of overlapping circles and triangles, the triangles being resistant samples. And the collector information is important because especially for extension agents, we can refine the data to the areas that that person is actively working. So we could, you know, restrict the data just to this area, or we could restrict the data just to farms that a certain collector has visited to give them and the grower the most up-to-date information. For the grower information, it's important to know which growers we're working with so that we can send them this farm history. Um, in this example, this is somebody who has sent us lots of samples historically and all these different colors just indicate all these different individual samples. Knowing the address, the farm name, and the GPS coordinates are also important. Several farms may have you know, many orchards and knowing which part of the farm resistance is found in can be really helpful. In this case, block name was also super important. We found resistant fire blight in this block and this block, but susceptibility in this one. So if you give us the name of the block in addition to these specific GPS coordinates, then we'll be able to tell you not only, you know, at this coordinates susceptibility was found or at this coordinates resistance is found, but we can say, you know, in block A and B, we found resistance and block C still only has susceptible fire blight to our knowledge. So maybe be extra careful moving equipment or reducing the spread in between these orchards. And GPS coordinates can be get, be got, sorry, <laughs> GPS coordinates can be collected using Google Maps if you drop a pin uh, where you're standing, it will give you the coordinates. And there's also several different apps that will just give you coordinates based on wherever you're standing. And that's a really easy way to collect that data. And again, the region and county data is super helpful for creating these maps. It's helpful for giving growers and extension agents an idea of what's going on in their particular region. And by sorting the data by region, because we have quite a bit of metadata, we hope to be able to give people what's most relevant and important to them. Overall conclusions for this presentation, strep resistance is found in many counties. Right now, 41, 23, 38 is confined to Western New York, but that doesn't mean that we won't see it popping up in other counties in the future. Um, so continuing with the CRISPR ID and trying to see if we can use that program to figure out if spread is going on. The 2023 sampling will again continue. The farm history will be available to any growers who wish to participate. And I just wanna reiterate the importance of year-to-year -year sampling, just to give you the most updated information on your growing operations so that you can optimize management to the best of your ability. With that, I wanna thank everybody in my lab who supported and helped me with this project. And really this, you know, none of this work is done alone. So I really wanna thank all of them. And if we have time for questions, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thank you, Isabella. And we do have um, a little bit of time for questions, a few minutes here. There was one already came into the chat. If anybody has other questions, feel free to put it in the chat, or you could always also just unmute yourself and ask it. But there was a question about testing availability for folks outside of New York State. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we do testing for other states. I have some samples from Vermont and Pennsylvania as well. I just included New York samples in this presentation, but absolutely we'll test for main growers. We'll test for anybody who's interested. Perfect. Great. Thank you. 
Um, I don't see any questions coming in yet, but uh, again, you guys can feel free to go ahead. Oh. So yeah, what was the focus on 4123.38 and why is yeah. that critical where that shows up? Yeah, absolutely. So 4123.38 is by far the most common resistance strain that we found. And that is the first, that is the profile of the first resistance sample that was found in New York. So that indicates that either this is, you know, diverging and originating in other parts of New York, or more likely that this original resistance sample when they thought that it was completely gotten rid of was actually dormant or I guess not dormant, but hidden by lots of more susceptible samples. And so understanding where the 4123.38 is because it is the most common one we're observing will give us an idea of how this particular strain profile is moving and if they're spread from Western New York to other parts of the state. Perfect. And yes, I think Carrick answered that only one of the samples had our PSL resistance. Other questions? Again, feel free to unmute yourselves. I'm really excited to, uh, you know, get those farm histories. I'm, I think that's going to be an interesting piece for some of the growers. So really excited to see that coming down the pipeline. Yeah, and there will also be an option um, when you sign up to receive a farm history, if you're comfortable sharing that information with your, like your specific on farm information with your extension agent, you can opt for that as well. And when we send it to you, we will send it to Janet or Mike. I mean, well, that being said, at any time you can write Janet and Mike and say, hey, uh, us and say, I want them to have my information. Oh yeah, of course. And would that also be true for spray consultants? Would that be something that you guys are offering if folks wanted to share that with their? Yeah, I think. Yeah, once we send it out to the individual grower, I mean, they're free to share it with whoever they want. Mm -hmm. um, in general, in presentations, we only share county level data so that there's still some anonymity and confidentiality. But um, because we're in contact with extension agents, if the growers want to opt for that, we're happy to share it with whoever they feel comfortable. And then if they want to share it with individual spray consultants, they absolutely can. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, also questions about anything that Carrick said or Liga said, if anybody. So if you have the RSP. Uh, yeah, if you have that point mutation, you probably shouldn't. I mean, even if you were mixing strep with oxytet, the strep wouldn't do anything, but the oxytet would still kill it. Yep. I mean, and if uh, we're recommending don't bother with strep, if you have streptomycin resistance, then it, that doesn't really change much else. It'll, you'll just kill it it just has a, a one point mutation yeah is the only no no i mean no you can i mean california's been living with it forever they used to mix uh use a lot of oxytet and stuff you can use kasugamycin it's all good and how does their resistant genes compare with ours um you know where does it is it the same mutation is it moved or is it a separate oh mutation? in that their case california is sort of away from that rpsl and they mostly have what we have now the two tandem genes that only deactivate at uh, 200 parts per million yeah a lot of people have these plasma borne resistances now right well i think unless any other questions continue to yeah and and i think on. glenn's case we're still no resistance elsewhere we did some surgeon testing and his stuff looks clean so elsewhere in the Northeast, you mean? Yep, in the Northeast and beyond, not Michigan, yep. Yeah, we have oh, found good. some my, resistance my in Vermont. Oh. Sorry, you were saying, Isabel, there was in Vermont. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. We have received some oh. samples from Vermont and we have found resistance there. Um, also a few, I think from Pennsylvania, but from years ago. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on at this moment from them. Um, but yeah, we do test from other states if you are interested in sending them to us. Well, well that was um, very informative. I hope everybody enjoyed and learned a lot. Um, I did pop that second link for the credits into the chat. So do go ahead and fill that out if you're looking for those DEC credits. Um, otherwise, I think that Carrick, Isabel, and Liga all put their contact information up at some point, but you guys know how to get in touch with them or else you can get in touch with me, Mike, or Dan, and we can put you in touch with them. So any follow-up questions, you know, feel free to reach out to any of us.
And I think that that is that. So I'm going to leave the um, Zoom going a little bit longer in case folks are still getting that link. But otherwise, um, thanks for joining us today.